Hey Hunters, welcome back. My name is Johanna and today's video is something very exciting because just when you think you know a site in ancient Egypt, you find something else even more amazing about it. So this site is one of my favourite places to visit in the whole of Egypt. It is the Osirian. And I've been there myself three times in the last three years. And just when I think that I couldn't be more excited or surprised about something, well, there we are. So I'm jumping on. We're going to do a video. Quickly, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Osirian is a very, very unique and unusual temple-like structure found in Abydos in Egypt. And what's unique about it is because it's found at the end of another temple, the Temple of Seti I. And as you can see from like an aerial point of view, most temples, the formulae of temples in ancient Egypt are sort of straight, long, rectangular shapes. What's interesting about the Temple of Seti is that it's it's on the wonk. It's got a, a sort of right angle. It makes like an L shape, which is very unusual in its design. And what is also unusual is at the end of where the temple should, in theory, continue on, you are hit with a second temple that is not connected to the, the set Temple of Seti. So the Assyrian and the Temple of Seti are two completely separate sites. Which was first? Was it the Temple of Seti and then the Assyrian? Was it the Assyrian and then Temple of Seti? Were they built at the same time or one after the other? So one argument is that the reason why the temple above ground is in an L shape is because when they were building the temple, they hit this even older ancient temple. And that could be one of the reasons why they decided to build it in an L shape. And you think, well, what are the chances of them building a temple on top of another temple? Everything in Egypt is to do with alignments, alignments to the stars. And so it wouldn't be that unusual that they would pick an ancient site that had already been picked for its geographical and astronomical alignments. So it's not out of impossibility that they could have been building something on top of something else. Or they did it on purpose. They wanted this temple to be absolutely as close as possible to an even ancient structure. And so they deliberately built it um, carefully around what was already there. Just so we know our timeline, Seti I was the 19th dynasty, which was around 1200 BC. So these, uh, the, the temple that is currently above ground is relatively new in terms of Egyptian structures. There is a very good argument on why it could be older, which I will get to later on in the video. 1903 was when the Assyrian was discovered by, or rediscovered, should we say, by modern eyes. When Flinders Petrie and his team, his wife, and an associate assistant called Miss Murray, Flinders Petrie told his wife and uh, Miss Murray to, to dig in a certain section. They were like, there you go, girls, you take that section there. And what did they do? They only found the bloody entrance to the Assyrian, didn't they? And then in 1912, they got enough time and money to do a second dig which helped uncover a lot more of the sort of entrance part uh, and it wasn't until 1914 that they really got in there and were able to uncover most of the entire site before that it was completely covered in sand and debris it was also in 1914 that they discovered it was really full of water progress couldn't happen really until the 1920s the water that is coming up into the assyrian is not nile water it's nothing to do with the river water they've chemically tested it it is completely different separate water source which is unusual because where the uh, the Assyrian is, is literally the desert. It is on the very edge of where the all the desert begins. Now I have to shout out a guy called Jim Westerman, who is one of the guys who has been pioneering the, the modern pumping of the Assyrian. And he's been studying this thing for like 20, 30 years. I got most of my information from his YouTube video, which I'm gonna link below. Now I didn't realize when visiting the Assyrian, just how big and deep the site goes. So here's a, a quick breakdown of the site. And you can see that there is like a sort of middle island, which is sandstone, and then huge single cut, one big old piece, granite block pillars. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, five, ten. There are ten huge granite block pillars. They are from Aswan, hundreds of miles away, and they most probably floated them up the river, but the Assyrian is still seven miles away from 
where the Nile River is or was. So that's a huge amount of uh, land to, to get these massive blocks. And they weigh like 70, 80 tons. They are absolutely huge. Insert photo of me next to granite blocks. Um, for reference, I'm like 5'9 with platform shoes. So that would make me about six foot. And you can see how huge they are. So we've got granite blocks. Um, what's missing today is the roof, which also would have been made by these huge megalithic granite blocks. Sandstone base and sandstone sort of side walls. And then the actual enclosure is limestone. Now, again, the sandstone is not local to the area. The only thing that is local to the area is the limestone, I believe. I hope I got that right. I did not realize just how deep the Assyrian goes. This is gonna blow your mind. So in this diagram, see here, you've got a little person and you've got the huge granite blocks. And that is the fl current floor level that you can walk around today when you visit. But the inner island, which has steps going down into the water, the inner island measures with, with seismic technology, they have calculated it to be 15 meters. 15 meters that is a five story building so what you're standing on top of today is the very top of a five story building going down into the earth this inner island now the seismic tests showed something else really exciting it is not one solid block going down that there is a hollow chamber in there who knows what the heck's inside there uh literally there hasn't been excavations going any further down because they cannot get the water out but whatever is down there it's hollow there's something going on it's very exciting okay now something very weird and interesting happened they brought in a huge rod for trying to manually measure how deep the the pit at the side of the Assyrian goes. And when Jim was poking around, he said when his stick went right the way down, his stick started to pull against something, almost like he'd caught a fish and he started to, to, to pull back on it. And this thing was sort of resisting him. And as he pulled up the, the pole, this weird hook flew out of the water. It got caught on the bottom of the measuring pole, way deep down, meters and meters down in the Assyrian. And this hook flew up out of the water and smacked him in the chest. Random. And this thing could be any old thing from any old time. But it's interesting because, do you remember Miss Murray? The, one of the ladies who actually discovered the Assyrian, she discovered this inscription on the wall and this image, and it showed Osiris sort of hovering a butt on a little pillar thing on a boat, holding a hook, a single hook, which is interesting because Osiris is normally seen with um, sort of a double hook thing crossed over the chest, but this one he's holding it out in front of him hooked like this. Is there a statue of Osiris 15 meters below somehow? I would say, I don't know. Um, and and did, his, did his hook, did his rod even get hooked on the hook and, and pull it up? I don't know. Could be a coincidence, but just a weird little anomaly that, that happened there. That is cool. So it's 15 meters deep, 12.5 meters wide, and 21.8 meters long. This is freaking huge. So now you can start to picture and understand just how much of an architectural feat it was to design and make this. The fact that they would have had to have dug at least 15 meters down to install this, build this chamber is phenomenal. Now it becomes a huge mysterious question of how the hell they did it when we come up against the water from the unknown source that is filling this temple area. So in the 1920s, they brought in a steam engine and a pump, thinking this would be strong enough to remove the water that had collected inside. So you can see, trying in the 1920s to, to pump it, but the pump wasn't strong enough, and they were coming up against a sort of mucky silt uh, that was really down deep, and they were having to manually try and move the silt and the muck with buckets. And you can see how deep they had to dig here. Uh, they had to build a, a deep, deep, deep pathway just so that they could try and get the steam engine um, and equipment into the whole Assyrian area. These amazing old photographs of these guys moving, um, moving these blocks just with rope and manpower. So they could only get so far in the 1920s because the pump just wasn't strong enough. So in more modern times, Jim Westerman and a team went in and they brought in even 
bigger pumps, even more strong modern pumps to try and get the water out of the Assyrians so they could really get to the chambers below and see what the hell was going on. And they did lots and lots of tests uh, while they were excavating or trying to excavate this site. Now they ran into problems as well. Even the modern pumps and machinery could not move the water fast enough out of the Assyrian. They even cordoned off part of the Assyrian and they built like a sandbank wall so that they were only trying to remove a, a part of the water, not even all of it. And the modern machine was struggling. The pump they were using was able to extract 500 gallons of water per minute and the Assyrian water came back in faster. Now for a water source to refill faster than something that can pump 500 gallons per minute, that is an extremely powerful water source and also a very clever water source because the water was only refilling in the selected areas behind the sandbank. The entire water level wasn't changing. So it was almost like the Assyrian could tell which area it needed to refill. It was a very bizarre experience for them. This photo here is where apparently one day it was all going quite well and they were managing to get a lot of the water quite significantly down and then suddenly like up from below it was gushing and bubbling a jet spring of water exactly in the area that they were removing it from uh, and start to fill back up again. So the water level that it is at today is the lowest level that they were able to get with modern machinery because if modern machinery can't pump the water lower than what it is today. How the hell did the ancients do it? Because when you look at structures that are built into water, this, this, the Assyrian was built into water. When you look at the building of the Golden Gate Bridge, how they built into water was they were able to isolate uh, around where they wanted to build the, the bridge leg and they were able to cut, cut it off from, from the water using you know, hydraulic pumps and get it down to the rock, drill into the rock and then allow the water back in. How could the ancients have done this if we're struggling to do it with modern day machinery? How did the ancients block the water source and for long enough enable to dig down 15 meters and place stones there? It is a big head scratcher and I have so much more respect for the Assyrian now I understand just how deep and complicated the, the water table is. Not only that, it was assumed that at some point there would be a foundational layer, they're like a foundational level of, of rock. The seismic tests, the measuring that they have done shows that actually there is not a solid foundation to the Assyrian. The Assyrian is built on water saturated sand. This entire site, it is all sat on water saturated sand, which again, shouldn't really be feasible. <laughs> Physics is throwing some real weird questions at this site. How the hell did they, one, dig it down without the water, and two, how did they build a very structurally sound, I mean, this thing is still here, 5,000 years, maybe more, it's still here and it's still standing, and how did they do it when there's no foundation? Just how far you have to go down before you would hit bedrock, and it's 900 meters. So there we go. Now, Jim Westerman was the dude that I mentioned who was leading the, uh, the mission to try and pump out the water of this place. He did a lot of tests. He did chemical analysis on the water. There is a water temperature anomaly and it's to do with thermodynamics. There is a heat source somewhere under the Osirian that is heating the water. So the water outside the Osirian, in other words, the water he's standing in is 16.9 centigrade, but the water inside the pipe is 23.8 centigrade. That's a significant difference. So that's an interesting fact, right? The sixth, water inside the open pipe is warmer than the ambient water outside the pipe. This is just a metal pipe. This appears to be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Heat cannot of itself pass from a cold to a hot body. They also did these water tests over three to four years and got the same conclusive results. So it wasn't just an anomaly of the day. Not only that, but Jim decided that he was going to try and drink the water. And obviously you're looking at it and you're like, oh my God, it's this horrible green gooey stuff. Uh, but once they had chemically tested the water and found out that it wasn't in fact sewer, it was coming from another source and um, that it was different to the Nile and it was in fact drinkable. Obviously he filtered it and he said that it didn't taste of absolutely, it didn't taste of anything. It was just, it was just water. But he decided because nobody to his knowledge ever had that he was gonna drink a lot of this water. So he drank, gallons and gallons and gallons of the Assyrian filtered 
water. Then something really remarkable happens that he says to this day he cannot explain. His eyesight, he'd been wearing glasses for years and he said that his eyesight improved. So much so he can quantifiably prove this. He went for a, a driver's test where they test your eyesight and he passed whereas before he always had to have glasses and he found his glasses actually irritated his eyes now. So he got his eyes tested and they said, you do not need glasses anymore. And he has no idea how his eyesight improved, but it did happen after drinking gallons and gallons and gallons of this water. Now there is obviously so many ancient traditions that water has healing powers and specific waters of specific chemical properties and mineral properties can help certain things. But Anyway, this is another thing that also needs to be studied at the Assyrian because the water here, it just hits different and it's fixing eyeballs and it's playing with the rules of thermodynamic science as we know it. I never noticed that inside one of the, the, the blocks uh, in the center, this is obviously where it's missing a granite um, pillar, but inside there is a little hole, like a pokey hole that's been drilled into the side. It goes right in. It obviously offshoots to somewhere else. Was this part of the original design? Was this part of how they pieced and interlocked things together? Was this part of the getting water systems to touch? I don't, I don't know, but it's just interesting. So the ongoing question, when was the Assyrian built? Was it in fact a legacy structure that has been left from a previous civilization? Is it an early first, second, third dynasty Egyptian structure? The 19th dynasty built a structure basically almost on top of it. Did they discover it then or did they always know it was there and that's why they put their site on top of the old site? There are arguments that sway, even though architecturally it's a completely different style to the, the, if you go into the temple that is above ground, it is beautiful. The temple of Seti is so stunning and it is covered head to toe in glyphs and imagery and inscriptions and it is the most colorful, most beautiful temple. It still has a lot of surviving color to this day, thousands of years later. The, there are pillars, which I call the penis pillars because they look like penises, but they've got these, huge phallic pillars that are built like a tube of rollos. They they are stacked, small blocks stacked one on top of the other. So this entire beautiful temple is built with lots of little tiny blocks and again, covered in stuff. If you were then gonna build a temple, a separate temple outside, and you then can choose a completely different style of building all together, completely different style of engineering. You're talking 80 ton megalithic t cut blocks. You're talking no glyphs. The Assyrian does not have any original glyphs um, to it. There is there is one wall at the back, which you can clearly see that at some point they, they were starting to put something on. Later dynasties were trying to add it, but it was not an original design to the Assyrian. The Assyrian was not supposed to have any writing or imagery or anything at all, which is in complete juxtaposition to the temple above it. Now we know how deep the Assyrian actually goes and we know that it is 15 meters at least deep as far as we can measure. You would need this amount of space to excavate out and dig out the rock and the sand and everything needed. Looking at the angle of the way the Assyrians built and how it goes straight down from that point, from a completely structural point of view, you would need this amount of space in order to build this site. It's almost impossible for the site to have been built after or alongside the Seti temple because it, it goes into the area of where the Seti temple is. What is exciting is that the Acida project, you can go, I'll put the link for their website as well. They've announced that a new, as of July, 2023, so literally this summer, they are starting more research into the Assyrian and a team are going back and they're going to be, they're gonna be doing more exploration on this amazing site. And we're hopefully gonna get a few more answers. So in summary, the Assyrian displays measurable and observable attributes, which are difficult to explain using the scientific method. I hope you've enjoyed this. I highly recommend getting out to Egypt and seeing the Assyrian for yourself. The pictures are incredible, but the feeling when you're standing down in the area yourself and touching these huge granite megalithic blocks, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So if you can, definitely recommend. 10 out of 10 on TripAdvisor, I would say. Until the next video, happy hunting.